So Kevin, uh, the first question that we have that we get from our customers mm -hmm. and our partners when they call in is when we're talking about vSphere with operations management, yeah. so vSOM, yeah. a lot of people are wondering about the operations management portion of vSOM. So what does the OM um and vSOM mean? Exactly. Right? Well, so, you know, I, I like to use that analogy of um, driving a car, right? You know, we, and, and, and those of you who have, who have uh, you know, seen me speak before or talked to me have, have, have heard me use this before. The net idea is this, you know, when you deploy virtualization into an environment, basically, you know, you're injecting cure into the environment but you have no idea how that cure is being measured. This is a lot like driving a car without having any gauges. You know, it's one thing to drive a car down the road and to be able to, you know, go fast and go a long distance, but if you don't have any, if you don't have a speedometer, you don't have any fuel gauges, you have no idea how long you're going to be able to sustain that speed for and, you know, how long, you, how far you're going to be able to, to, to go. So when we're looking at attaching operations management, we're really giving gauges to that car. We get insight into the overall health of the environment, the efficiency of the environment, as well as any potential risks that we have. So not only are we getting gauges, we're also getting the glowing lights on the dashboard so that we know if there's anything urgent we need to deal with. So if somebody were to ask, what is the OM and VSOM? I would say it's really about insight. It's about having a clear vision of what's going on inside of the data center that you've already made such tremendous investments in. Great question. And to kind of take a step back, for those that may not be familiar with vSOM, mm -hmm. the, uh, the whole idea of vSOM as a whole, we, we just talked about you know, what is the operations management portion yeah. of uh, vSphere with operations management, but to keep in mind that the the vSOM package is essentially going to be giving you those vSphere licenses along with the operations management that Kevin was just talking about. So kind of taking it back a little bit to yep. basics, it, what vSOM is, in case you're not familiar, is that packaging of your vSphere along with the capability of operations management. Yeah, and that's huge. So if, if, we, if we look at the total package, you're now moving away from just vSphere to vSphere with operations management, away from just injecting cure and virtualization into injecting the cure and virtualization and being able to meter, monitor, and create forecast and predictive analysis based upon the information that it finds, which it's also exceptionally easy to set up. So it's able to give you data very, very quickly that's really meaningful inside of your environment. Gotcha. And I can say from personal experience from back when I was a, a virtual administrator working on an enterprise, we did not have operations management, we just had vSphere vCenter. And when they would come to us with information such as fisc fiscal budget concerns, are we going to mm -hmm. need additional hardware, additional vSphere licenses, anything like that, it was almost impossible to give a really an accurate idea of what the potential was needed for the next either fiscal year or the next couple of years from a budgeting perspective. And, and then just from an operational standpoint, being able to try to manage your environment without having that, that insight into your operations, it, it, was, it was very hard. You're always, I was always being reactive all the time. Yeah. Uh, never was I being proactive because I just didn't have that insight to be proactive. So Well, I mean, I used to, I always said, you know, IT doesn't spend all of its time fixing problems. It spends time finding the problems. And especially when you look at a, virtual, at a virtualized environment, you don't necessarily have a light on the front of the server that tells you when things are wrong. So you're no longer trying to find a needle in a haystack, you're trying to find a needle in a needle stack. Yeah. And that's really hard. Um, and ops allows you to kind of pull out the information that's going to be the most meaningful to you. All right, cool. Last thing we'll mention is that in addition, we also offer the vSphere optimization assessment that gives you a great way to leap off and learn more about operations as you move ahead. So be sure to check in with your local representation about that. Awesome question. Thank Thanks. You. So I understand we have a question about the, um, the additions in, in uh, vRealize operations. What, what do they have to say? Yes. Um, a lot of questions that we get when we get on the subject, um, we get past the initial, um, kind of like our previous question about what is vSOM or what does operations management do? Yeah. So when we get into talking about what their needs are and we start talking about the different additions, mm -hmm. one question that always seems to come up when you look at standard compared to the advanced versions, yeah. when you look at the description in advanced, it says that you can monitor hardware. 
So there's a little bit of confusion from a lot of people about what does that mean com between the standard and the advanced because, edition? Because I need to monitor my host because that's yes, where my VMs are. Because you, yeah. your hosts are hardware, so yeah. do I, am I not able to get insight ah. into my host with standard? Do I have to go with advanced in order to get that insight into my host? So that's there's a lot of confusion there typically. Okay, so I, I think the best way to think about this would be to understand the layers that exist. So, you know, if, if you consider the fact that, you know, you've got your hardware and that's, that's, your, that's your server. So the, the hardware sits here. Now, on top of that hardware, we have what's called the virtualization layer or the hypervisor. And that hypervisor sits just above the hardware. That's our binary translation. So all of the stuff that's happening with the virtual machines is hitting that hypervisor and that's how the virtual machines are communicating with the hardware. Inside of standard, Effectively what's happening is you're getting insight into the hypervisor layer. So the, you still are getting performance on the host. You're still able to see uh, you know, how all of the resources that the hypervisor is aware of so the CPU, the, the CPU, the RAM, yeah, CPU, we'll the memory, you know, uh, I/O consumption, all of that. They're going to have that in standard, mm -hmm. but it's going to be filtered, if you will, through the eyes of the hypervisor. It's what the hypervisor sees that it's attached to, right? So now you get into advanced, and we're kind of changing the conversation a little bit. There, what we're doing is we're saying now we can look at the configuration of the physical hardware itself, right? What's down there sitting on the bottom. So if we want to look at things like um, maybe hardening for compliance or uh, you know, maybe uh, I.O. throughput and um, the connectivity and performance of things inside of the physical world. So this could be uh, the information that's coming in and out of the network cards. Okay. you know, down inside of the hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, this also includes the ability to integrate with other APIs for, you know, storage and networking. So now we're, we're, we're opening our scope, so we're no longer being filtered through the eyes of the hypervisor, which is still giving us performance on, on the, the host, yeah. but we're able to now see what happens be below that information, so we're going out into the data center. Okay. So, you know, in a nutshell, basically, we're, we're looking at for the standard, you're getting kind of that surface level information, mm -hmm. just a standard, my uh, compute, my CPU, my RAM, insight into that type of how, level. How is my physical exactly. hardware being utilized virtually? But, That's a great way to yes. think but about it. But then when we go into the advanced, it gives us that much deeper look. It also adds into now we can, uh, you know, a part of managing a virtualized environment, you, you don't want to just monitor your host and your yeah. VMs. A part of that is also your storage, yeah. your networking. So having that deeper insight, that's where we start looking at the, the higher level additions so mm -hmm. that we can get that deeper insight, both deeper and also wider too, because now we're getting that insight into networking, into storage, and getting that more complete picture of an operational environment. Yeah, absolutely. And we can start to see not only how our virtual machines um, being being accessed, but how are they impacting the rest of the environment? And how it impacts your VMs as well. Absolutely. Great, Great. question. Cool. So we have another question. Um, so uh, th this one I think has something to do with uh, disaster recovery or business continuity. Yeah, let me read it right out of here okay. so I get it right, make okay. sure I'm asking the right question. It says, I'm building a full site DR plan okay. and steps required to power up my 20 VMs at a DR site. What is everything I need to consider when powering up my VMs in vCloud Air DR to minimize business impact, such as maybe a CRM tool, an email server, Active Directory, basically all the work that people are going to need and the supporting services behind that. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, it's it's a it's that's a, little big that's, of a, that's question, a big question. We let's I guess kind we'll of try to try to boil it down as much yes, as we can. Okay, down to the core so so yeah, and I think that's a great point. Let's yeah. boil it down to the core concepts. So the first core, the first set of core concepts that I think needs to be understood, um, because they said a key word in there. They said to minimize business impact. Mm -hmm. So if I was presented with that question, my first response would be with a question: What is your business impact? What can you withstand? Right, because every business can withstand something different. Um, for example, a mom and pop sock company in Carborough, North Carolina, might be able to, you know, be offline for a week, maybe two. Um, but I seriously doubt that Google can be down that long without somebody noticing. Because <laughs> where else are you going to find keyboard cats that quick, right? Okay, so uh, I think that, and and that idea is actually down to two things, and um, it, it's going to be the idea of. 
RPO, which is your recovery point objective. Basically what that means is the point in time at which your data needs to be recovered to. So when things come back online, I need my data within 15 minutes of the disaster. All right? And also your recovery time objective. How long until we need to have things back online? Um, the world blows up, well, probably not the world, but we, the, the data center blows up at uh, you know, 4 p.m. I need things back online by 6 p.m. That's a two hour RTO. So the first thing to determine is what are those two numbers? Now, and that's going to be different for everybody. That's going to be different for everybody. And within that, then you determine your application tiers, right? Mm -hmm. And you know some uh, uh, some common application tiers uh, are going to be inside of what would be considered like tier one. Tier one applications are mission critical. These are things that have to be alive to keep the business up. So uh, probably one of the first things you're going to want to spin up is uh, you know maybe like a um, an NTP server uh, for time, and then your Active well, Directory. So your domain controllers yeah. need to come up first yep. to provide all those exactly core right credentials, yep. services, time, and everything else. Yep, and then you're going to you know so everybody everybody gets access, and then you're going to uh, spin up uh, you know communications between mm -hmm. everyone. So you're going to have your email. And then you're going to uh, start spinning up, you know, databases. Um, now, uh, depending upon what's relying upon what, you're going to spin them up in different order. The idea is you're going to start downstream, and you're going to make sure that every all of its upstream dependencies. So basically, if um, you're spinning up SharePoint, SharePoint needs databases. So what comes first? You need its upstream component to come first. So that means that you're going to start with the database and then spin up SharePoint next. Yeah. Okay. And if there's a three-tier web app, you would bring up the, the database, database you bring and then up the, the app, app, and, and then, then the, the web app. Web. Yeah, yep, exactly. absolutely. So, so think of everything in yeah. tiers. And, and so when you have those tiers, you start with tier one first, everything that falls into tier one, and then tier two would be your next target which would be, um, you know, like maybe document sharing and, and file, file management. Servers, and stuff th like yeah, that, stuff yeah. like that. Things that you can live without yeah. for an, a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And then the last stuff is like tier three. That's going to be, you know, dev, test, marketing, yeah. things that can be offline for longer time. Both systems, yeah. yeah. And the reason this is important is if you focus just on the things, the lifeblood of the, of the business, then you're going to be able to provision and purchase more effectively when you're looking at things like using disaster recovery as a service because you don't necessarily have to protect your entire environment. Yeah. You just need to protect the things that are the lifeblood of your business. Yeah, and with our DR you can cherry pick which VMs associated yeah. to those core services that are the, the tier one or tier two, which yeah. ones you want to protect. Yep. And of course the best practice would be for to help expedite the process of bringing that all up in a DR would be to create workflows. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe use something like vRealize Orchestrator to yep. go ahead and create a workflow to help you spin up those in the proper order to make sure that everything comes up properly. Because yep. you can't just power them all on and expect all your apps to work oh, and everything else. Obviously. Yeah, well ab absolutely. And you know, in, in addition and in addition to that, you know, you, you're, you're also going to be looking at the ability to do things like database synchronization, mm -hmm. right? So with VMware's uh, purchase and acquisition of Continuant, we now offer database as a service yes. so that you can have databases running out inside of the cloud that you can synchronize your local information with mm -hmm. so that you can then use those databases as a secure target to build up everything on top of. Yeah, and I know that that was always a big hindrance for a lot of people getting a DR plan to the cloud because a lot of those core business, you know, the business critical apps, they typically have a database in the back end. So you have to be able to keep those synced up between each other and that, it, you either had to use a third party or that was always a kind of a challenging aspect of creating a DR plan. Oh yeah, and, and that's been a huge step forward with, with the continuing acquisition. We're starting to, and we, and we continue to see more and more advancements inside of that space, what we're able to offer with, you know, as a service, um, you know, functionality. Did, 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 did we did we cap the question? I think we got that one? I, I think we got the core of uh, what the question was, yes. Okay, cool. So, you know, with that, be sure to check out more about vCloud Air Disaster Recovery as a Service and reach out to your local representatives and they'll be able to tell you even more and help you design the solution that's right for you. Thank cool. you.
So we've got another question, and this one they're coming in. There's, this is about uh, virtual storage area network, or vSAN. Um, so they say, what do I need for vSAN to work? Uh, licensing, hardware, et cetera. So basically, I'm new to vSAN. I have no idea what's going on. What do I need? I know ready nodes are one way to go. Yes. There are different ways in which you can build out a vSAN environment. Mm -hmm. The easy, One of the easiest ways, as you were talking about, was the vSAN ready nodes. Mm -hmm. vSAN ready nodes, basically, we've already configured all the hardware, the server, the, the controller, the SSD card, the regular hard drives, mm -hmm. all those, and we've we put them together all off the hardware compatibility list because that is critical for vSAN to make sure that all your hardware does meet the hardware compatibility list. And so we basically put it together in a pre-packaged server for you. And then that way you can just buy the minimum, which is at least three, preferred as four nodes, mm -hmm. um, to get started with building your vSAN environment. So that's the easiest way. Now you can piecemeal servers together. Um, you could order a server and then individually buy all the components, again, making sure that they're all on the hardware compatibility list. But the easiest way is to do it with the ready nodes. Now there is another option as well. We do have the Evil Rail, which mm -hmm. is essentially a four node uh, it's a hyper-converged appliance. Yeah, yeah, it's an appliance. So there's basically four vSAN ready nodes already in it in one box, making it very easy. And then it has a software interface that makes it very easy that once you got it all hooked up to power to the network, within 15 minutes, you can have your environment up and ready to start spinning up new VMs. Yeah. So that's the easiest way. Yep, absolutely. So there's, there's basically three options. You either piecemeal it, ready nodes, or Evo Rail. Yep. So those are the ways in which you can consume vSAN. Now, as I said, the hardware compatibility list is an important factor in that. So it's not like you can just go up and get any server, any controller card off the shelf no. uh, when you're putting together. A yeah, because because we have to test for vSAN, we've yes. got hardware that we, that is proven to be compatible, and that also allows you to stay inside of uh, you know support agreements with global support. Yeah, because we want to make sure that it's going to live up to what we say it can do. It, yeah, exactly. And that's important. You yeah, know, we're not going to. We don't. Want somebody going and just using any old software and hardware, and then there's they're saying, well, why isn't it performing? Yeah. Well, it's you know there's because a reason for that. Exactly. Now, now you buy vSAN. You it, it is available in some bundles. Like uh, it's available inside of Horizon. Um, you know, advanced. You you yes. get vSAN for your for your environment, which is really cool because vSAN is is designed for read intensive uh, environments, which we we know VDI yes. is one, as well as clouds. So one of the primary use cases for yeah, vSAN. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And. Um, you know, you can also purchase it a la carte, and um, it's a, a per processor. Yes. And Same one, th yep. And one thing to remember about Virtual SAN is that you know you need a minimum of three nodes inside of the cluster. Yes. Okay, so you need the minimum of three. Best practice four. Exactly, best yeah. practice four because it, you know, and I think we have another video on that, and yes. I'll uh, I'll go ahead and show a link to that one right down here somewhere. So if you want to find out why it's four and not three, just click down here, and um, but then also, you know, you can uh, you have to remember that while when you get the three, that you can have a maximum of now 32 nodes in a vSAN cluster, which is just staggering. Yes. Um, but that every host that you introduce into the cluster, whether it is contributing to the storage or not, mm -hmm. needs to be licensed for virtual SAN. Yes, correct. Because virtual SAN is a cluster-based technology. It lives at the cluster layer, so it needs to know that everything inside of that cluster space is licensed to access the virtual SAN because it's going to play a part in the scale and the adaptability and flexibility of what virtual SAN does. Yeah, and while we're on the licensing portion, another important part, ever since we came out with vSAN 6.0, we've included the new capability of having an all-flash version of vSAN. Mm -hmm. So once you're looking to use vSAN in an all-flash manner, there is a additional license for that. So when you're talking to a partner and you're putting together a, a uh, quote for them, you have your initial vSAN licensing, but then if they're looking to use the all flash way of doing vSAN, you're gonna also have to add and make sure that you're adding that extra license for the all flash portion. The all flash, yeah, yes. absolutely. So hopefully that puts a tin lid on that question so you can consume it three ways. 
either through hardware compatibility or, or what we would consider like you know build your own or kind of roll your own type environments, and then uh, you know ready nodes which are available directly from the OEMs, and then also through Evo, yes. um, Evo Rail, and, and and now forthcoming Evo Rack, yes. um, and then uh, you, from licensing it's either through a bundle, um, it's included in Evo of course, yes. or you can consume it per processor and then just license everything in there, minimum of three, maximum of 32 in each individual cluster. But be sure to reach out to your local engineering teams and your storage specialists for more details on how to configure virtual SAN. Yes. Cool. Excellent question. Thank you. All right, so we've got another question on vSAN. Um, and th this question is, is kind of a cool one. They're saying, um, when I create a 100 gig virtual machine with virtual SAN, how much storage does it actually use in the vSAN data store? Now, let's first say this. The best answer for this is to go out to the vSAN online calculator and to use the tools that VMware has. We have an online vSAN ROI calculator tool and I'll, we've got a link for it right here. And that's gonna be the one that you can go out, you can determine how many virtual machines you have, how many VMs per cluster, how big they are, and it will calculate it for you. Do that first. But let's talk about kind of I guess the the, the bones the bones of, of yeah, yeah. Of, of how you if you had to do it with a pencil which you shouldn't do this yeah. is kind of how you might approach it so so let's take an example we got a VM that has a hundred gig uh, virtual hard drive on okay so just real quick if you wanted to again scratch it on paper is how much space that's actually going to take up in your vSAN data store well. vSAN is going to make a copy of that VM. So right there, you're going to double it. So we're going to have 200 gigs allocated, 100 gigs per the original VM as well as the duplicate copy of it. Again, because we want to make sure it's redundant. That's the whole point of this. Yeah. Um, but then on top of it, let's say that this VM also has 10 gigs of virtual RAM as well. We do also need to accommodate that as well. So there's 10 gigs of RAM per copy of VM, so that's another 20. So just as a real quick and dirty calculation, we're looking at 220 gigs of space mm -hmm. for that one VM now, in your virtual data store. Now, but it's important yes. to remember there's a that, caveat. yeah, there's yes. a caveat, and the, the idea to remember is that there's a difference between allocation and consumption. Yes. And this is true in all storage, and in virtual machinery, we know this because when we build a virtual machine, it says you have three ways to provision it. You can provision it thin provisioning, thick uh, provisioning uh, lazy zero, mm -hmm. right? Or thick provisioning eager yes. zero. Yeah. So what does that mean? Thin provision means all the storage is going to sit there. I'm going, if I need some, I'm going to come over here, scrub it off, clean it up, and consume the little bit that I need, all right? So it's kind of, it's sipping storage. But that also means that it's got to take the time to clean it up and consume it. So it's a little slower. However, if you're doing lazy zero thick provisioning, it means, okay, well, I'm going to say all of this is mine. I'm just not going to clean it and scrub it up until I need it. And so as it consumes it, it goes ahead and cleans off the bits that it needs. It's a little faster because it doesn't have to go and grab it. Yeah. It just needs to clean it up so that it's ready. Then you have eager zero, which means you give me this much space, I'm going to grab it, bring it in, clean it, polish it up, reduce it to nothing, so that the minute I need it, it's right there. That's going to be your fastest, but it's also going to be the most consumptive. So when we look at this 220 gigs, mm -hmm. we have to realize that that's the information that storage administration needs so that they don't grossly over allocate storage. Yes. However, that does not mean that the minute you spin it up, a VM that's 100 gigs, but you make it thin provisioning, it's really only going to use a fraction of that. You're just using that as a size estimation so that you don't over bloat your storage. But it's always a great policy to use somewhere between like a 15, uh, uh, 
to like 17, 20% buffer mm -hmm. on top of whatever your calculation is, that will give some accommodation for things like swap file growth and, and you know, uh, some snapshots that may happen inside of that space. It also gives you a little room before things get weird. Yeah, you always wanna, whenever you're calculating out any type of storage needs, you're always gonna put you know, a certain percentage above and beyond what, you, what you've already calculated, say this is what I need because you gotta, you gotta calculate for the additional growth because storage, you don't go out buying every six months to a year. Typically, you're gonna go out and buy storage every three to five years. Yeah. So you've gotta accommodate that growth so when you're calculating that on top of coming up with that initial number that you think you may need right now, mm -hmm. you definitely wanna put a, a percentage buffer in there for that as well. Absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's very important to, to not only throw in that buffer, but you know you raise a great point. One of the things that's different about virtual SAN is the fact that you can buy it in not just every three to five years. I'm you're that. Yeah, yeah. You, you, know, you could have a three node vSAN cluster that you've sized perfectly as your mm -hmm. starter. And then if you want to, you can grow it granularly. You can slap on just another one host or another one or two or three hosts until you get to your 32. So it doesn't have to be this big, daunting, crazy investment you know, every three years. And that's the other benefit of vSAN yeah. is that upfront cost, <clears throat> excuse me, that upfront cost, you don't necessarily have to put that money up front with that planning of the three to five years like yep. a, a traditional storage yep. guy would have to do. It can grow can, along with you. Yes, yeah. you can You can get what you need right now with a little extra, obviously. Yep. You're still gonna wanna have that little extra in there, but then as your needs grow a year, two years down the road, you just add additional nodes. But it's not a matter of just adding nodes as well. If you need some additional storage and you have the room inside your ready mm -hmm. nodes, if you have extra uh, slots for additional hard drives, you can also increase your data store just by adding simply drives to and the that, nodes. And that would be your scale up methodology, yes. which if you want more details on the differences between scale up and scale out, mm -hmm. check out this video here, because we've actually got a session yes. on why you would pick one versus the other. There are, there are considerations to be made in either scaling up or yes. scaling out. Um, and it's, it's kind of a balance between licensing and cost mm -hmm. and performance and scale. And also what you have available because if you spec'd out your, your ready nodes right from the start and filled all your slots, then obviously you don't have the option to add additional drives to do that. Absolutely. So or then if you're you kind of, you would have to go to additional uh, Scale out. Yeah. Or if you spec them out with inferior uh, solid state drives, mm -hmm. then the cost of upgrading the solid state drives in to you know, be compatible across all of your scale up yes. might be more cost prohibitive than just buying another node. Yes. So there's a lot of considerations. Again, check yeah. out the video. Um, here's a link again, and um, that'll give you a little more details. So excellent questions on virtual SAN today. Definitely. So we've got another question, and this one is around a project that is, of course, super near and dear to my heart. Probably one of my favorite things to talk about in the whole world, um, and user compute. Imagine that. Imagine that. So um, anybody who knows me gets a joke. Okay. So, so the question what is, the is question? Uh, what is everything I need for a 50 user VDI project? Okay. So I, I'm going to start really simple. Um, I would say the same thing over and over and over again. There is no pat answer to this, There's right? There is no universal answer There for this is one. no universal answer for this one. What you need for a 50 user VDI environment is what you need for a 50 user VDI environment. You see, I don't know, you don't, well, you may know, but I seriously doubt that you do too. What are your users actually using? What, how are they accessing their applications? What's actually being consumed of their laptops, mm -hmm. right? How much CPU, how much memory, how much disk? So these are things we don't know. So the right answer to this question is not a server, right? The right answer to this question it depends. is it depends and the first thing you should do is get an assessment. And even if you're moving forward with a small scale environment, and 50 is most certainly a small scale environment, then the right answer would be, if you're going to do it on premise, then go with an assessment first, because that's going to make the most effective use and ensure that you do not over purchase your VDI. Because let's say you've got 50 users, great example. You have 50 users, but they work two shifts. You do not need to buy 50 seats 
of VDI. You only need to buy 25 because you're only going to have 25 concurrent connections at any yes. given time. So just by knowing the use case, and that may or may not be the case in your environment, mm -hmm. but by knowing those use cases and doing those assessments, you could cut your bill in half for what you're walking into. Now, 50 is an interesting number because 50 is also the minimum package size for Horizon uh, Air with desktop as a service. Yes. So you could, if you don't want to go on-premise, you could purchase 50 uh, desktops inside of Horizon Air. And there are different tiers. And uh, I think they start at what, about 35 bucks or something like uh, that? I believe the standard yeah. is $35 a desktop. Yeah. And so that we have you know, basic and then more performant desktops. But then all of that is managed within our cloud. So you don't have to worry about any of the on-premise configurations. Mm -hmm. The last way would be, I think, through Evo. Now, Evo might be kind of gross overkill for 50 users, yeah, but, let's, much, but. but let's say maybe you've got 100 or 200 users. That may be a great time to drop in Evo Rail because it includes your virtual infrastructure as well as virtual SAN. So it's going to have storage and everything baked right in there. Yeah, so a good example with the Evo Rail would be, say we got a company that's got multiple sites, and they got a lot of remote sites. They need to basically stand up a brand new like mini SDDC, Software Defined Data Center. Evo Rail is a great example of that for them. It's a great way to be able to, to give them that software defined data center on a kind of a little bit smaller scale than what they need back at the headquarters, but spin it up really quickly and it'll support the desktops as well. Yep. And to kind of take a step back from where we originally started with this question, you start talking about assessments. I assume you're talking about the SysTrack assessment. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Why, why don't you tell them a little bit about that? So VMware has partnered with Lakeside to um, to offer the uh, Horizon uh, VMware SysTrack assessment. Mm -hmm. So the net net is you drop in the tool. The tool is going to go out and scan the environment of desktops. Okay, so you're going to give it access into everything that is a desktop essentially. Yes. Okay? And then it's going to come back and it's going to give you points of reportability on things like memory consumption, um, uh, CPU consumption, I.O. disk consumption. And the reason we do that is because every user uses their laptops or desktops differently. We need to develop a lowest common denominator set of use cases because that's really going to be the most effective way to deploy an end user mm -hmm. compute environment. You don't want to say, oh, well, everybody's going to have a different machine because everybody has a different machine now. And that's that's one of the things about uh, basically uh, putting together a VDI environment and makes it so challenging putting it together is yeah. that you may actually have a couple of different um, types of users. So you may have people such as developers. They yeah. need to have um, the right amount of resources for their VMs. Yeah. So in compared to the standard user, they may just use maybe Internet Explorer and, and uh, Office. Yeah, for exactly. So that gives us a lot more flexibility. So the right answer is get your assessment or look at Horizon Air, or lastly, you can look at Evo for larger environments. Excellent question. I think that answers it. Great.